My name is Mike Flannery. I'm Associate Director for Historical Collections here at UAB, and welcome <coughs> to the first of our 2009-2010 lecture series. Today we have with us, um, I think it's going to be a very interesting and, and timely uh, presentation by Eric Boyle. Uh, Dr. Boyle received his PhD in the history of science, technology, and medicine from the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2007. His dissertation, The Boundaries of Medicine, Redefining Therapeutic Ar Orthodoxy in an Age of Reform, analyzed and contextualized what became normative in the early 20th century American medical marketplace by examining the shifting boundaries between orthodox and unorthodox therapies. Uh, using methodol methodological framework of boundary formation, his dissertation interpreted effective and ineffective ways of acquiring, formulating, and providing reliable medical knowledge while examining how and where cultural credibility has been determined in particular. Um, from 2007-2008, Dr. Boyle worked as visiting assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where he taught courses in the history of alternative medicine, medical technology, and healthcare in the United States. As DeWitt Stetton Memorial Fellow, he is working on a project that contextualizes the political, economic, philosophical, scientific, and professional factors involved in the creation and operation of the Office of Alternative Medicine and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. I think with uh, that background and those credentials, uh, we should uh, uh, be ready for a very informative uh, and, and a very enlightening presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Boyle. Hello, and thank you all for coming today. It's great to see uh, so many people here. Um, I'd like to begin by, by thanking Mike Flannery and all the people here at the Reynolds Library and UAB for their hospitality and for the opportunity to talk about my ongoing research project today. Uh, I look forward as well to any questions or comments you might have after the talk, um, so please keep those in mind throughout. Um, as a Stetton postdoctoral fellow, as Mike mentioned, uh, supported by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, my research at the Office of NIH History um, explores the role played by the NIH in the evolving relationship between conventional medicine and complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, as I'll refer to it for the remainder of the lecture. Uh, my study begins in 1991, when Congress first passed legislation to create uh, the Office of Alternative Medicine. Surprisingly, it went relatively unnoticed. Uh, there was only $2 million allocated for its first year of funding, but by 1999, with the expansion of the OAM into the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, the annual budget had grown to $50 million a year. Uh, Ten years later, the annual budget now exceeds $120 million and funds a growing network of intramural and extramural research all over the country, uh, including here at UAB. Yet despite the dramatically expanded role of the NIH, in the field of CAM that has resulted, and the fact that most recent studies show that nearly four in 10 Americans are using some form of CAM, no extensive study of the role of the NIH in this process has been undertaken. So my research seeks to fill this void. Uh, specifically, in my two-year project, I'm examining the role of the NIH in obtaining and disseminating uh, knowledge about CAM to practitioners and the public, uh, here I'm concerned with questions about the relationship between researchers, uh, the public, doctors, uh, other interest groups or stakeholders. Uh, I asked what role the office and center have played in redefining these relationships and what role government funded scientific research specifically has played in evaluating therapeutic practices and what impact these changes have had on research methodologies and clinical practices. Uh, given the highly contested nature of, of, the, of this work, I'm also interested in evaluating some of the controversies and strong sentiments expressed both for and against the research itself. 
Right. Now, CAM at the NIH has been scientifically and politically controversial over the past two decades. So today, I will address some of the contentious aspects of this recent history as well. To give you a, an overview, I will begin with some of the ongoing contemporary debates about NCAM um, before moving back in time to outline earlier ways in which its predecessor organization, the Office of Alternative Medicine, or OAM as I'll refer to it, came under fire. I'll then move further back in time a bit to talk about the two prevailing origin stories for the office. Uh, here I'll briefly identify some of the challenges involved with studying the history of complementary and alternative medicine more broadly as well. This will be followed by a brief look at some of the uh, a brief look at some of the early work of the office, along with some of the lessons that were learned before turning to a deeper examination of some of the unique challenges uh, faced by leadership and the transition to a full-fledged center of research in the late 1990s. I'll then conclude with some final thoughts on the history of alternative medicine at the NIH. NCAM's controversial 10-year history was recently addressed on February 26th of this year at a Senate meeting titled Integrative Care, a Pathway to a Healthier Nation. The chairperson of the meeting, Democratic Senator Tom Harkin uh, from Iowa, was integral in writing the initial legislation that established the OAM in 1992. Uh, later in 1998, along with Senator Bill Frist, Harkin helped expand the office into a national center. Uh, at the February meeting this year, Harkin began by noting that as it has become fashionable recently to quote Abraham Lincoln, so he would like to quote from Lincoln's 1862 address to Congress, words that he argued should inspire us all as we craft health care reform legislation. Lincoln said, quote, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty. As our case is new, so must we think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Harkin went on to say, quote, clearly the time has come to think anew and to disenthrall ourselves from the dogmas and biases that have made our current health care system, which is based overwhelmingly on conventional medicine, so wasteful and dysfunctional. He argued that it is time to end the discrimination against alternative health care practices. Time for America's health care system to emphasize coordination and continuity of care, patient centeredness, and prevention. For Harkin, adopting an integrative approach meant taking advantage of the very best scientifically based medicines and therapies, whether conventional or unconventional. Yet when turning his discussion to NCAM's past, Harkin expressed his disappointment with the work that the center had conducted over the last 10 years. He said, quote, one of the purposes of this center was to investigate and validate alternative approaches. And quite frankly, I must say publicly that it has fallen short. Harkin lamented that instead, quote, in this center and previously the office before it, most of its focus has been on disproving things rather than seeking out and approving. Harkin's words almost immediately became fodder for his critics, uh, and critics of NCAM in general, in the blogosphere. One blogger summed things up this way, quote, Harkin is mad because the folks at NCAM just don't understand what being the beneficiary of an earmark is all about. If some helpful Democratic senator from Iowa gets you and all your pals employed in a nice shiny center to study the impact of moonbeams and warm kumbayas on heart disease, then by God, you better find some beneficial effects on heart disease, capiche? Because if you don't validate your purpose, if you don't show your, show your loyalty to your patron by validating the money he brought home to you, why, you're just throwing it all away. Meanwhile, over at the science-based medicine blog, David Borsky offered this take. Quote, Tom Harkin does not want NCAM to work by the scientific method. Not really. He has claimed that he does, but his statements above make it clear that he only likes the scientific method when its results are what he wants them to be. 
Under NCAM, many studies have been performed by believers under conditions quite favorable to producing apparently positive results, yet few and far between are any results resembling anything positive when it comes to NCAM funded studies, and they're virtually non-existent for studies funded by NCAM for the major CAM modalities. I begin by introducing some of these pointed contemporary perspectives, in part because they reveal some of the inherent challenges faced by the OAM and NCAM in terms of answering their critics and meeting their congressional mandates. But in, my, my, in the remainder of my talk today, I would also like to suggest that the study of the history of alternative medicine at the NIH offers greater insight into historical and ongoing relationships between politics, science, medicine, and the transcendent ideologies that shape each. These relationships are highlighted in two very different origin stories that have been told about the Office of Alternative Medicine. By one account, the OAM was created because of the support of a misguided senator who was influenced by shaky anecdotal evidence and his own emotional response to disease. According to this story, as told by NCAM skeptic Wallace Sampson in his article, Dancing with a Dream, The Folly of Pursuing Alternative Medicine, the OAM was not uh, formed because of any medical or scientific need, but because Iowa Senator Tom Harkin believed in implausible health claims as a result of his own experience and the experiences of close friends. By another account, the OAM was created because of the growing interest in and use of alternative medicine by the general public. According to this story, as told by former NCAM director Stephen Strauss and others, as well as the first government report on CAM titled Alternative Medicine Expanding Medical Horizons, which I'll talk more about shortly, Senator Harkins and others pushed for the creation of the OAM to meet a medical and scientific need that no other organization was adequately addressing. In particular, the question of whether or not uh, alternative medicines were effective and safe. With this origin story, emphasis is placed on evidence for the broad interest in alternative medicine at the time. Uh, in 1993, for example, the uh, first national survey of alternative medicine used by Americans uh, expressed surprise in reporting the quote-unquote enormous presence of healing alternatives in American society. The report found that a full one-third of adults in the U.S. used at least one alternative therapy in the year study, 1991, the same year the OAM was created. The truth, of course, is much more complicated than either of these rather simple explanations. Harkin was certainly the key player behind the creation of the OAM uh, and may have made decisions based primarily on anecdotal evidence when he used his position as Appropriations Committee Chair to direct $2 million in NIH discretionary funds to start up the office in 1992. But it's also clear that Harkin believed he was responding to an important public need one reflected in the increased use, of, in, increased use of alternative medicines, but also in the public demand for information regarding their safety and effectiveness. Now, the congressional mandate establishing the office in 92 was designed to meet that demand and opened up the office within the office of the NIH director for the purpose of investigating, evaluating, and validating effective unconventional treatments. The mandate also charged the OAM with two additional tasks. One, setting up a research training program to teach individuals to perform research on alternative medicine and to teach researchers about what key areas of inquiry merited priority status. And two, establishing a public clearinghouse to facilitate exchange of information with the public. In response to the creation of the office, one constituent concerned about the potential laissez-faire attitude about the study and acceptance of alternative medical methods fired off letters to Ralph Nader, Senator Harkin, and NIH Director Harold Varmus. In response to the writer's concern that rigorous research would not be devoted to the very best alternative medical therapies available, but rather those with the most aggressive lobbyists, 
The first director of the OAN, Joseph Jacobs, laid out the purpose of the office in the following <coughs> terms. Quote, the office was created in response to the strong public demand for information about alternative medical treatments. Its primary mission is to give fair evaluation of alternative medical practices by supporting research and clinical trials to investigate their effectiveness. The position of the office is as advocate for the fair evaluation of alternative medical treatments, not as advocate for the alternative treatments themselves. We are as anxious as you are in, uh, to obtain definitive results which will confirm or refute claims of efficacy and safety. <laughs> Carrying out this work proved to be quite challenging, and the OAM had a rather rocky start. During the first few years, the office became embroiled in a number of controversies between different stakeholders who were witness to, but also affected directly by the office's work. One of the first decisions of the interim OAM director, for example, uh, inspired a backlash from the conventional biomedical community. In September of 1992, acting director Stephen Groff uh, con convened a three-day public meeting at the Westfields International Conference Center in Chantilly, Virginia, where over 100 practitioners and defenders of alternative medicine met to discuss the state of the field. Broad discussions of methodology, information dissemination, and the peer review process were also included in the course of three days of intense idea, idea sharing, as participants <coughs> described it, and debate. Uh, the U.S. Government Printing Office then published the results of the meeting in 1995 as the first comprehensive report on the status of alternative medicine in the U.S., optimistically titled, Alternative Medicine, Expanding Medical Horizons. This was significant because it was the first time that the government had paid for or published a report that took a sympathetic look at what was essentially a list of close to 300 areas of research which individuals at the Chantilly meetings felt had been neglected and needed to be looked at through official medical and research channels. Nevertheless, it was therefore, therefore also panned by some critics for being an extended advertisement for alternative therapies that were yet to be proven either safe or effective. The president of the American Physical Society, for example, wrote to NIH director Varmus to express dismay at what he referred to as a quote-unquote most remarkable report which demonstrated an appalling ignorance of basic physics. He included an attachment which marked several pages from the report that in his, his words, offended scientific <coughs> sensibility. In response, Varmus asserted that, quote, the OAM and the National Institutes of Health as a whole are determined to ensure that the scientific methods are rigorously applied to determinations regarding the effects of alternative therapies in the improvement of the health of the American people. We welcome the assistance of all scientists and of the American Physical Society in defining the scientific approaches needed to study such therapies. While the OAM faced nearly constant criticism of this type, the office still <coughs> quietly accomplished a number of goals in its early years, and along the way learned several lessons about the difficulties involved in subjecting alternative medicine to scientific scrutiny and the challenges of limited funding and ongoing political wrangles. First, in funding a trial for a popular but marginalized and understudied unconventional treatment through the National Cancer Institute, the OAM learned that the interaction between the fields of alternative and orthodox medicine can result in conflicts that stifle dialogue and impede research. The choice to focus on an alternative cancer therapy reflected the fact that a number of groups that had been integrally involved in pushing for the formation of the OAM were especially interested in CAM cancer therapies. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of public inquiries directed to the office in its early years were in fact about cancer. So the office gave a large portion of its budget at the time to NCI to sp specifically investigate a controversial type of therapy developed by physician and immunologist Stanislaw Brzezinski, 
who had opened up a large clinic in Texas where he treated patients with advanced cancer and claimed high success rates. The OAM asked the NCI to look at this. They subsequently evaluated some of Brzezinski's cases and decided it was worth doing a preliminary trial. By 1994, at the time of a site visit to the facility operated by Dr. Brzezinski in Houston, Texas, OAM Director Jacobs reported that a phase two study of anti-neoplastons for brain tumors was already underway at the Mayo Clinic and the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. The trial, however, ultimately failed in the sense that it failed to even be completed. Because of disagreements between NCI researchers and Brzezinski over trial protocols, the clinical trials were stopped in 1995. No definitive conclusions about the effectiveness of these particular therapies resulted, and critics deemed it a failure. Nevertheless, this effort demonstrated that it was at least possible to set up a clinical trial for a marginalized and under-researched therapy, and created widespread buzz about the potential benefits of future research. This effort relates closely to the second lesson learned by the office in its early years. Studying alternative medicine with prevailing orthodox techniques may be valuable, but it is also inherently problematic, in part because of the sheer number of alternative therapeutic practices out there, but also because not all have been proven to be amenable to conventional scientific scrutiny. These problems became particularly clear when the OAM put out its first request for grant applications in 1992 the first time the NIH had declared its interest in funding CAM research. Given the large number of research areas and limited OAM budget, the request for applications was for extremely small amounts for largely exploratory research. There were initially to be 30 projects, uh, mostly observational studies. 800 letters of intent to submit applications were received and 452 applications eventually submitted, one of the largest responses ever to a single RFA in the NIH's history. The applications were reviewed through the Division of Research Grants, which scored groups of applications per an elaborate conventional peer review process for evaluating the scientific merit and other aspects of the applications. But here's where things got a little messy. Uh, reviewing CAM proposals proved to be difficult and controversial. First, as mentioned earlier, the review process was challenging because of the diversity of CAM practices themselves. Uh, here's just a few categories of CAM practices, but within these categories uh, were dozens of uh, specific treatment modalities. This made it challenging in some cases to match up applications with specific institutes that then might fund the research. But secondly, the OAM also faced challenges in finding qualified individuals to review these applications who had expertise in the areas under review. Uh, there wasn't always someone at the NIH who was an expert in mind-body interventions, for example, or energy therapies. Um, and also had a full understanding of the scientific methods embraced by the NIH. This represented a controversial but nevertheless opportune situation in which the OAM proposed that it would be worthwhile to do research in a rigorous way using methodology true to existing scientific practices, but in a way that would be um, sensitive to the model or system of CAM um, that may have developed completely outside the boundaries of conventional science and for which there might not even be an appropriate language for communicating. Uh, the office was willing to make this sort of bridge. The early impact of this work was limited not only by funds but also because the OAM was not authorized to, to uh, oversee research directly. As an office, it had to go through institutes, <coughs> larger institutes, to order, in order to fund projects that they were interested in and would also meet OAM goals. The requirement to do this work through other institutes, however, had a beneficial outcome in the form of lesson number three for the office. The integration of alternative medicine into existing biomedical structures facilitates 
further acceptance. While this might seem obvious in hindsight, many representatives of the alternative medicine community at the time, like the patient in this comic, had little faith in so-called Western medicine. But the third thing that the OAM did successfully in its early years was to integrate alternative medicine research more fully within the, the NIH as well as with outside research centers. This included funding centers for alternative medicine research in mainstream universities around the country, along with funding a number of conferences and meetings on topics ranging from research methodology to pain research, as well as the first NIH consensus conference on acupuncture and the first international CAM conference on cancer. Perhaps the greatest source of controversy and hardest lesson we've learned learned came with the office's efforts to operate its public information clearinghouse. The OAM didn't establish its clearinghouse until October of 1996, despite the original congressional mandate in 1992 to do so. Uh, the second director of the OAM, Wayne Jonas, explained that the delay had been justified by fears that this was where the height of controversy for the OAM would eventually take hold, which proved to be correct. Jonas felt that because the NIH was perceived by many as the ultimate authority on information in biomedical science, there was a temptation among the CAM advocacy community to approach the office as offering validation by affiliation. Jonas also believed that while providing public information through the NIH could have a tremendous impact on people's opinions about topics, in the areas where there was a need and demand for information, there was also a great risk that the information may be misinterpreted. Consequently, a great deal of time and effort was invested in determining how the NIH and the OAM could appropriately package, filter, and provide to the public accurate information as early as possible, uh, but at the same time without misleading. This included the establishment of a media relations and outreach department along with an official communications policy, a system for responding to public inquiries, uh, which had reached on average about 1,200 a month by mid-1996. In tackling each of these aforementioned areas, public relations, integration, and funding research, OAM leadership faced unique political and scientific challenges. <clears throat> the first director of the office, for example, Dr. Joseph Jacobs, left in September of 1994 after a tenure of less than two years. In departing, Jacobs complained of being pressured to both speed up studies and mark dubious products with a stamp of approval. In an interview after his departure from the NIH, Jacobs also complained <coughs> that Senator Harkins had inappropriately held the entire OAM budget hostage at one time until it was agreed to put three of the senator's so-called Harkinite friends on the office's new advisory committee. So as he departed to his former home, Jacobs quipped, I prefer the ticks of Connecticut to the politics of Washington. <laughs> Jacob's successor, Dr. Wayne Jonas, moved quickly to reorganize the office into six functional units that would meet its congressional mandate. The staff doubled in size, Congress continued expanding the office's budget, but Jonas also suffered from the burden of being backed by Senator Harkin. Additionally, he was panned by skeptics due to his sympathetic stance on homeopathy having co-authored two books on the subject, one targeting consumers and the other, the other appealing to MDs to integrate homeopathic and conventional practice. In one critical letter sent to the office of the NIH director, the writer argued that Jonas's book on homeopathy demonstrated not only ignorance of basic quantum mechanics and molecular physics, terms that were used by Jonas with abandon, but with the very concept of the scientific method itself. Jonas also came under fire from NIH leadership when he identified purposes or goals for the OAM that either went far beyond the office's congressional mandate or did not clearly reflect the official position of the NIH. 
especially with his critiques of the methodological limitations of investigating alternative medicine within the prevailing NIH research paradigm. For example, following the publication of an article on the challenges of conducting alternative medicine research in the journal Nature Medicine in 1997, in which Jonas argued that the role of the office was to, quote, unquote, re-examine the goals of medicine and science in light of unorthodox systems and concepts by pursuing radical solutions and no longer holding on with blind faith to methodological and conceptual dogma within a narrow worldview. Jonas was scolded by the NIH director for his inability to follow direction and for cir circumventing the NIH review process with the media. At the same time, the OAM came under fire from outside sources as well. That month, Science Magazine reported that some big guns, including biologist Paul Bird of Stanford and physicist D. Allen Bromley of Yale, were taking aim at the future of the Office of Alternative Medicine, a place the magazine referred to as the quote unquote, home of far out ideas on medical therapy. Amid Senate hearings to discuss renewal of the office's $12.5 million budget, a number of top scientists had sent letters to the members of the Appropriations Committee recommending that funding be cut or eliminated. Paul Berg, for example, called OAM an embarrassment to serious scientists, adding, quackery will always prey on the gullible and uninformed, but we certainly should not provide it cover within the NIH or from the NIH. Maxine Singer, president of the Carnegie Institution in Washington, D.C., wrote that the OAM's work was not usually congruent with the rigorous standards of mainline research and recommended that funding be cut or eliminated. Biologist Ursula Goodenough of Washington University in St. Louis also wrote that nothing comes from OAM and coming from OAM indicates that it is conducting or planning any studies that would put any alternative treatments to a scientific test. Former presidential science advisor uh, D. Allen Bromley, meanwhile, wrote that the OAM had given prestige to highly dubious practices, some of which clearly violate basic laws of physics and more clearly resemble witchcraft than medicine. He recommended terminating the office. Later that year, in October 1997, Former heart surgeon Bill Frist, chair of the Labor and Human Resources Subcommittee on Public Health and Safety, called a hearing to explore issues related to the office in the NIH reauthorization bill. Two scientists testified in favor of Harkin's proposal to turn the office into an independent center with the power to form its own peer review panels and distribute grants. Internist and assistant professor of medicine, David Eisenberg of Harvard Medical School, who had published that study back in 1993 um, uh, on alternative medicine use by the American public, uh, was also a standing member of the OAM scientific advisory panel and noted that an estimated 61 million Americans were using alternative therapies ranging from herbal treatments to hypnosis, spending as much as $14 billion a year. James Gordon, a professor of psychiatry and family medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine, added that as many as 70% of cancer patients were reportedly seeking some form of alternative therapy. According to Senator Harkin, these figures were reason enough to focus more research in an area where, quote, the public has been voting with their pocketbooks all along. However, a third member of Immunologist Robert Rich, Dean of Research at Baylor College of Medicine and representative for the Association of American Medical Colleges, said uh, creation of a separate center would double administrative costs and might actually hinder research. He argued that the current arrangement in which the office could support grants through existing institutes took advantage of those institutes' expertise in particular diseases. Uh, for example, he noted that OAM director Wayne Jonas had pr uh, praised a cooperative new study by the office, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the Office of Dietary Supplements on the use of St. John's wort for clinical depression. A separate center, Rich argued, 
would emphasize the gap between so-called alternative and conventional therapies. That dichotomy was wrong, according to Rich, who argued that, quote, the dichotomy is between good science and bad science. He urged, as scientists, we need to be disciplining ourselves to base our research on hypotheses, not belief systems. According to panel member Gordon, the problem with this mindset was that the office had been unable to fully investigate alternative treatments according to the standards of good science, precisely because it had been institutionally and financially shackled. They needed greater freedom and more money. He suggested that as long as the OAM had to depend on other institutes to sponsor the evaluation of apparently promising but nevertheless controversial and unconventional treatments, careful scientific investigation would proceed at a snail's pace. Robert Park of the American Physical Society, meanwhile, supported efforts to investigate alternative medicine, but insisted it must be provided that the research was held to a rigorous standard, was suitably peer-reviewed, and was fairly administered. Uh, after the hearing, Frist reported that he sensed a fear that such a peer review process at an independent center would, quote, not demand the same rigorous science as is demanded historically by the institutes that are in existence. This led Park, a longtime critic of OAM, to conclude that, quote, for the time being, the center concept is dead. In fact, Harkin's proposal to elevate the office to a national center fell short during the appropriations process in 1997, although the 60% increase in funding represented a victory of sorts. The $8 million boost raised OAM's budget to $20 million for 1998. Now, despite facing the defeat of Harkin's proposal in late 1997 and the departure of D Director Wayne Jonas in 1998, the OAM was still upgraded to the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in 1999, expanding its budget to $50 million and creating the new NCAM director, Stephen Strauss, uh, who was granted uh, greater decision-making authority than his predecessors, especially concerning financial and administrative management, along with the fiscal and review responsibility for grants and contracts. Um, INCAM could now control its own research, direct it in areas that it wanted to, and it had more money to do so. Dr. Strauss, the first director of INCAM, uh, a highly respected NIH physician researcher, seemed ideally suited for the task of exploring complementary and alternative medicine in the context of rigorous science. With 23 years of experience at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, including eight years as chief of the Laboratory of Clinical Investigation, Strauss had investigated a range of diseases and es uh, established a track record that had earned him the respect of NIH Institute directors. Equally important for uh, relations with the wider scientific community, though, Strauss was also quickly uh, reassuring critics and skeptics that he would not support NIH-sponsored quackery. In uh, an article titled Alternative Medicine, Stephen Strauss's Impossible Job, published in Science in 2000, Strauss insisted he was not an advocate for alternative therapies, only an advocate of good science. Although he reportedly didn't practice alternative medicine nor use any personally, he was also clear that he did not reject alternative practices out of hand. As a physician, he had sometimes referred his patients with chronic fatigue or acute pain to hypnosis, acupuncture, and other practices if they weren't satisfied with the standard care. In taking the NCAM job, Strauss was also cognizant of the fact that he was walking a tightrope. He understood that skeptical scientists and powerful supporters of alternative medicine would both be measuring his performance by their own criteria. By 2001, just two years into his tenure, Strauss was interviewed for another piece on the mainstreaming of alternative medicine in The Lancet. And here he reported that NCAM had already quadrupled its staff, developed a strategic plan, added intramural and international research components, 
and started working with industry to develop product standards. Strauss made it a fundamental goal to, quote, transition the field from anecdotes to evidence by emphasizing the importance of sponsoring large-scale clinical trials while also concentrating effort on studying the neurological, clinical, and physiological bases for the underlying mechanisms of poorly understood CAM therapies. The accomplishments of NCAM under Strauss, who, whose tenure lasted through 2006, are noteworthy. I'll just mention a few of these in, uh, in a couple of areas that tie into NCAM's congressional mandate in the interest of time. Uh, in terms of CAM research results, as measured in mainstream publications, by 2004, 149 OAM and NCAM grants could be identified as yielding publications. This included 701 manuscripts, 507 of which were indexed in Medline. Uh, by 2009, over 2,800 articles <coughs> citing NCAM uh, support could be found on PubMed. In terms of information dissemination, NCAM also moved quickly to meet the congressional mandate of serving as a public clearinghouse. Uh, working in conjunction with the National Library of Medicine, CAM on PubMed was also established in 2001, offering a specialized literature uh, search tool for research-based information on CAM. Uh, the CAM website was upgraded in 2004 and receiving 1.3 million visitors a year. Other dissemination components included a newsletter, an array of public education materials, and nationwide meetings, exhibits, and lectures. These efforts were made possible in part due to the steady increase in NCAM's budget from 1999 to 2005, as seen in this graph. Uh, over a six-year period, the NCAM budget grew from $40.5 million to $121.3 million, while the overall NIH budget nearly doubled over the same time frame. Of course, it can also be argued that these increases in funding were made possible by the success of NCAM's research and dissemination efforts themselves. Despite these successes, however, um, many of the same critiques that plagued the fledgling Office of Alternative Medicine have remained among alternative medicine skeptics and medical quackery critics. Medical skeptics have questioned whether the goals established by NCAM can even be met. They argue that each new regime in the office and center has made the same promises and each has said that the research that was done before was incomplete. According to uh, skeptics, the authors of these studies in recent years have frequently concluded that the evidence is too weak to draw definitive conclusions or that flaws in the design of trials make the results inconclusive, <coughs> therefore requiring more grants for more research. Medical quackery critic Stephen Barrett of quackwatch.com adds that, quote, the overall message that the officer center has been sending since before it opened is that there's really something here that the scientific community is overlooking. And if we study it, then we're going to find out what it is. According to Barrett and others, that message is nonsense. In fact, as this graph indicates, um, less than half the money spent on CAM research at the NIH in recent years has been allocated to NCAM. Um, the blue color uh, represents the NCAM budget, uh, the purple represents the funding of CAM research by other institutes, and the lighter kind of yellowish color is the total amount spent by the NIH annually on CAM. Uh, while Barrett and others might suggest this is evidence that the study of CAM uh, should be conducted in other NIH institutes and centers, where CAM projects have to compete among conventional projects for funding, I would suggest that it's important to remember that the funding of CAM research is only one of the important functions of NCAM as an organization. Um, as the winter issue of Medline Plus, the magazine, reported, new NCAM director, Dr. Josephine Briggs, intends to continue the center's commitment to expanding medical horizons carrying out those three responsibilities laid out in the original congressional mandate uh, that I mentioned earlier. In marking its 10th anniversary this year, NCAM has distributed banners across the NIH campus celebrating, quote unquote, 10 years of rigorous research. But the center has also defined, uh, redefined its priorities in the context of an even broader mission. 
uh, in addition to 236 completed clinical trials and nearly 100 active trials on a wide range of therapies, including dietary supplements like echinacea, glucosamine, uh, and ginkgo biloba, the effects of yoga, meditation, homeopathy, music therapy, osteopathic and chiropractic manipulations, traditional Chinese medicine, and others. Uh, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine has made a commitment to support research in the areas of international health as well, uh, in healthcare services, and the ethical and legal implications of complementary and alternative medicine. As Dr. Briggs asserts, the research, uh, the results of the research in this area will be particularly important given that nearly 40% of Americans depend on some, fort of, some form of CAM to treat various health conditions or maintain well-being. While we'll uh, have to wait to evaluate the effects of much of this work in years to come, I would like to close by offering the following points about the potential value in understanding this history of alternative medicine at the NIH. First, I would like to suggest that given the fiscal limitations, scientific and administrative challenges, and the political machinations involved in pursuing their respective congressional mandates, the accomplishments of the Office of Alternative Medicine and NCAM have been noteworthy and in many cases quite impressive. Second, I would also argue that the history of NCAM indicates that its future success will require an effort to address the critics of CAM more directly while also addressing the value of CAM for a variety of stakeholders. Uh, clinically, in the domain of integrative care for doctors and patients, economically, in the potential for reduced medical costs for consumers, corporations, and insurers, and socially, in the realm of health promotion and reduced disease burdens. Lastly, in returning to the Lincoln quote with which we began, I would also argue that when evaluating the history of the office and center, the dogmas of the quiet past are indeed inadequate to the stormy present. If we are to understand the history of these institutions and the history of alternative medicine more broadly, we must therefore engage in the delicate task of disenthralling ourselves from the polemical arguments on either side among both advocates and skeptics.